So Rick, welcome to the show, man. It's good. Uh, it's good to speak with you. Thanks for having me, Greg. Uh, it's, it's awesome to be here. Absolutely. So let's let's start off. I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about where the idea for uh, Simply Noted came from. V uh, very, very cool concept. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, it really started when I was going to grad school. Um, I, I graduated with my undergrad in 2010, but after I got done playing sports and you know went through the medical device career for about five or six years, I went back and uh, did my MBA in 2017. And um, it really started as an idea. Um, it was a project uh, for school. And I just was really fascinated with it, and um, it just grew organically over time. So, you know, over the course of about 12 to 18 months of really just kind of researching this, seeing if I could do it, did it as like a side project for school, um, just decided to jump in with two feet. And uh, you know, fast forward three and a half, almost four, four years from when I did that, you know, 11 full-time employees. Um, if you want to count contractors, we have over 30. Um, I, we actually just um, got accepted for the Inc. 5000. So um, that's, you know, the, the you know, fastest growing private companies in the U.S. So a lot of good things are happening and we're really excited about it. Yeah, fantastic. So how, talk to me a little bit about the project. Like where, you know, what was the project that sort of uh, gave genesis to this idea? Yeah, so in our cohort, we had we we were in groups um, in one of our classes, and we had to come up with a business plan. Um, you know, it's kind of a basic MBA type of project. And I had a, a classmate of mine um, that we were—I mean, we we're both in sales. Um, we were always thinking of ways. You know, we're super competitive. We were trying to think of ways to get in front of our clients, stand out. You know, um, and just be better sales reps. And we knew about a company called Bond back in the day. Um, they're no longer a company, but they focused on um, the wedding market and they use 3D printers um, to do handwritten notes for weddings. I was like, man, this would be so much better in a B2B market. They should be focusing on businesses because businesses have relationships with clients. They have the software, they have the revenue. Nobody's doing something like this. So um, we just started researching it. You know, we looked at Technologies in China, technologies in South America. We worked at the mailing house here locally in, in Phoenix. Um, tried every off the off the shelf solution there was out there for writing notes with you know a robot writing notes, and um, we actually ended up just building our own proprietary robot um, just because it really fit. It needed to be a purposely built writing robot, not some laser printer or three D printer. Um, so yeah. So the way the technology works, unlike a, a, a printer, which would just be like, hey, we're going to sort of copy whatever, you know, a computer comes up with. Yeah. You actually have a robot that works in a 3D fashion that is actually, that literally writes the notes for you. So it's, it's, it's yeah, unbelievable. You know, it, it sounds, uh, forward facing, it, it sounds a little, maybe not as in depth or crazy or complicated um, because really we're just writing handwritten notes, but the technology that goes into building um, a company like Simply Noted, where we're an API first platform that helps companies integrate and automate sending handwritten notes. Um, you know, it really starts from an API on a website, but then yeah. it goes to, you know, the the cloud that where we store and handle and put our orders together before we send them to the machines. But within the machines, you know, there's a ton of technology within the, the, the handwriting engine. Um, we're not doing fonts here. We actually do real handwriting styles. Um, I can spend an hour just talking about handwriting styles with ligatures yeah. and kerning and, you know, font creation and all this stuff. But it's actually really, um, <laughs> you know, if I if I knew about how, how much technology that was going to be involved in this, I probably wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have got started in 2017 because I, I was a sales and marketing guy. I wasn't a, a tech founder. So, um, yeah, there's a lot that goes into this. It, first of all, it sounds wildly complex. So I, <laughs> there's there's no part of me that that hears that and thinks, oh, that's easy to do. And maybe and maybe that's because I do have a tech background and I understand actually what's involved in taking something like that to from concept to life. And you know, I guess just uh, I initially kind of having a chance to look at it, I would have thought like, oh, you know, you came up with a way to like design a font and and sort of like do this like handwritten type of font and then print it. But you know, when you actually describe it as like you know, conceptually, like literally a robot's writing this, handwriting this letter. It, it's it's pretty impressive. Uh, so, you know, you, you mentioned something that's funny. I just, I'll say this real quick. I've talked to a couple other founders 
who have almost said the same thing. It's like this ignorance is bliss thing where it's like, if I knew how hard this was, I don't even think I would get started in it. And it's like, you know, you just, you just go into it kind of like heads down and, and uh, you know, you don't know how difficult it's going to be. So you're able to just kind of like, just run through the wall and make it happen. Right. I can, you know, do a, you know, a sports analogy here. Um, you know, it took, it takes 15, 20 years really to become like a professional athlete, right? You start as a, as right. a, a kid, right? And if you knew all the pain and all the aches and the injuries and everything that goes into it as a seven year old, you'd be like, man, this, this is too hard, right? Like, um, when you're a kid, it's just, it's a lot of work, right? And, um, but as an athlete, you develop those transferable skills that you can then, you know, translate over to a business career later. But I, I think this is the same thing as, um, my uh my college football career you know those freshman year sophomore year you know, you're yeah. really just starting to get your feet wet right your junior senior year you know what you're doing right year three year four um that's really when you start taking off and that's really what's happening here um we're really into going into our third full-time year you know we're about three and a half years full-time in our business you know it's the same type of thing you know freshman year sophomore mm -hmm. year you're just learning the ropes you're figuring it out you're learning how to be on the team you're learning how to read defense or offenses and and the same thing here, I'm, I'm learning the market, I'm learning, you know, the niche and who needs this and, you know, mailing codes and nonprofits, how to talk to nonprofits, how to talk to political agents. And so we're just, we're excited because we're just kind of hitting that, that, that growth trajectory in that third, fourth year. So, you know, you're in, you're, uh, you're in medical sales, you're, uh, you know, I'm assuming doing well, uh, it's, it's a lucrative business. You can make good money and you decide to go pursue this, uh, the this startup, this, mm -hmm. this kind of crazy idea. I'm sure people said it was crazy. You, you don't have a tech background. There's, there's significant amount of engineering involved in this. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what led you to do that? So, so when I got done with football, um, I, you know, I reached out to some other athletes that got done playing and, I wanted to know what they did because I was like, I thought I was going to play until I was 30 and I was going to be able to retire and be a, you know, own a gym or train people. And that just didn't happen. Um, so when I got into medical device sales, I mean, I literally super competitive, super driven. I was an associate sales rep for one year and I was a top three rep for the last four years. Um, you know, president's club every year as a sales rep, but <laughs> I always, I had a, my parents were small business owners. They weren't, you know, they didn't have $10 million companies. I, my, my stepdad was a contractor and my mom um, was a medical biller and they were very available um, as parents when we were growing up. They went to all our practices, all our games. Um, if we needed to do something, they didn't have to worry about work, you know, getting in the way. They were like, well, we'll just, you need it, we'll go do this and they'll go work. And I, I wanted to have that same type of lifestyle in my career. Um, with medical sales was, you know, getting into middle management and upper management, then moving my family all over the, all over the country. And we, we had a striker ask me if I was interested in going to Australia, you know, and helping them launch a product in Australia. And yeah, so um, that wasn't the career that I wanted. I didn't want to, you know, be flying all over the country multiple days a week. I wanted to try being an entrepreneur when I was young. Um, I wanted to try uh, starting a business um, before we had kids and you know, we got, you know, busy with school and sports and all of that stuff. So um, that's really what kind of drove me into entrepreneurship. Yeah, I have a similar story. I, you know, I, had, I was an entrepreneur real early in my career, but then I, I moved in uh, into the enterprise kind of big company world. And um, you're primarily on the business development program management side, uh, working for a company that was, you know, $7 billion a year revenue. I big expense account, traveling all over the world, spent a lot of time throughout Asia and Europe and, and money was good. Actually, to be honest, it didn't work that hard. Uh, it wasn't that difficult and it just wasn't doing it for me. You know, like I, I, I just, something about, I guess, entrepreneurship, it's a challenge. Maybe it is, you know, that it soul, background, right? Yeah. Like there's that, there's something inside you that, you know, it can't be fulfilled without, you know, with your, with the journey you're talking about of being an entrepreneur. Um, I, I feel like, you know, you either are an entrepreneur or you're not, you know, like you just said, like not working, you know, at that job, it didn't really pull everything out of you and you, you were still being successful you know, as an athlete. You want to be challenged. Um, if you're not being challenged, you're going to get bored. And if you're bored, you're going to lose interest. And then, you know, you're just not going to be fulfilled. And right. 
as athletes, you just need that. And I don't, I don't know if it's ever going to go away. You know, I'm 33 and, uh, <laughs> maybe the chip on the shoulder will, will eventually go away and I can slow down, but I feel the same way. Medical sales. Yeah. I was making good money. Um, I didn't have to worry about payroll. I didn't have to worry about bills or vendors or, you know, any, any of the responsibilities I had now. Um, <laughs> But this is more fulfilling. It's more fun. That's right. right. I'm developing as a person. I'm, I'm challenging myself. I'm proving that I can do it. Um, and I think that's important as an athlete. Um, take on challenges. And if you fail, if you're a real athlete, you're going to just stop at nothing until you figure out how to be successful at it. That's right. That's right. You 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 just said chip on the shoulder. Uh, I've talked about that a lot, actually, with with people on the show in the past. And you know, it, it's something that there's a a commonality to it with 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 a lot of people that are just successful in life. It's, it's like, I, I don't even know what it is. I mean, it's not like there's anything necessarily bad happened, but it's this like drive to just keep doing more. Right. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's really this high achievement mentality or high achievement mindset. Uh, yeah. Where, where do you think your chip comes from? You kind of use, you use that term. I mean, I don't want to get too personal, but uh, my father yeah. passed away when I was seven. So okay. I always kind of had uh, you know, a little bit of a chip. But um, yeah, I, I think you're born with it as well because it it is a uh, it's relentlessly top of mind. You know, um, if you're an overachieving type of person, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You want to be the best in your relationship. You want to be the best in the gym. You want to be the best at your job. You want to be the best at sales. And it's a blessing and a curse um, because you can't shut it off. And I think that, you know, I'm talking about the chip comes off the shoulder, you know, maybe later in life, but as a young retired athlete, that chip is still there, right? Because a lot of athletes, you know, mentally and physically, they still want to play. They can still play. They still have all that, that energy they need to get out um, because that's what they're used to. And that's what like fulfilled them. And um, I think that mentality of just forward progression, no matter what, get better, you know, self-help, like, how can I become a better teammate? Like, how can I be more efficient at this? You know, if I did a million in sales this year, I'm going to do 1.5 or two next year. Like, it's just, it's in your brain and it's, it's impossible to shut off. Yeah. What, you know, another, I guess, similarity between our backgrounds, um, not that I'm trying to compare us is, uh, I went and got an MBA later on after, um, you know, kind of been in my professional career for a little while. And I know the reasons why I did it. I mean, personally, it was a little bit about, uh, you know, wanting to be able to, to, to get broader and be able to move more into like, you know, entrepreneurship and general management. And just, there were just some yeah. skill gaps that I had. Uh, what was that thought process for you going into it? Because it's time consuming yeah. and expensive. Yeah. So, um, well, first, you know, I was the first to go to like, uh, I was the first generation college student. Um, so it was important for me to even graduate and go. Um, it was really important for me to go and continue my education as a professional. Um, you know, if I was going to stay in corporate America, I thought that was going to be better for my career. Um, I have two young kids. I want to show them like, hey, like your your grandparents didn't go to school, but your dad did. And you can do all these new things like if you want. Right. Um, you just got to push through it. But really what I was trying to get out of it was I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And um I just thought that was the next best step. I wanted to get out of medical. I wanted to get out of career sales. Um, I wanted to mm. develop some hard skills, um, you know, develop some real knowledge that would have value if I ended up did staying in corporate. Right. But I also wanted to see if it would help me become an entrepreneur. And <laughs> it literally really? did like it, like within like eight months of being there, you know, I just like, boom, light bulb went off. I'm running with this. Um, this is great. You know? So I ended up getting, you know, what I wanted out of it. And you bootstrapped this whole thing, right? You haven't raised any outside capital. I'm incredibly proud of the fact that we've done that. Um, it's it's really fun. We do have a couple of competitors in this space, and they're either you know funded by you know VC or uh, you know venture capitalists, or they're they're funded from previous exits. So I started this on a ten thousand dollar no interest credit card. Um, no debt, no loans, no investors, been profitable since day one. Um, like I said, we made the ink, we're making the ink 5,000, um, fastest growing companies. So it's definitely not the route to take for the, the most faint of heart. Cause when you're having bills that are $50,000 selling a $2 item, two or $3 item, 
you know, those, <laughs> those are big bills. But um, yeah, I'm incredibly proud. It's I wanted to prove to myself I could become an entrepreneur, start a successful business, do it with no debt. And um, so far, we've been able to do that. Nice. And yeah, you, you talked a little bit about this, but I, I always find the early part of the entrepreneur journey, you know, sort of the most exciting, right? It's the creation aspect. Uh, I mean, scaling a business has its own level of challenges, but you know, you talked a little bit about you guys trying to find this technology. It's an API driven product. So there's a, there's an entire, you know, code development layer to this. Um, where, how did you find, I mean, like, how did, how did you decide on the, the vendors, right? I mean, it's easy to throw away money. I made every mistake and threw away a lot of money. So, um, you know, again, I have no technical background. So our first website was on a, a WordPress platform, but we had no API at that time. And then we went to a Drupal platform and I had our, and everything grew as my, as our business grew, my budget for projects grew. So I was able to hire better people. Yeah. You know, every step of the way there's been problems, but yeah, we started on WordPress with no API. It was just an online e-commerce website. And then we got on the Drupal. Um, I worked with somebody on Fiverr um, to develop an API for a Zapier integration. Um, but that website just had so many problems. And then we got on the Shopify and Shopify took, it's not the best platform. So, I mean, I've learned in it. The, the hard thing about a startup is like, you can't do analysis paralysis. Like, you have right. to keep making decisions every single day, you know, as you know, but they have to, I always do the bowling ball or bullets and bowling ball method. You have to make small mistakes, small mistakes. You can't shoot, you know, a big cannonball, you know, at a target if you don't know if it's going to hit it. Right. So that's what we've been doing. Smaller projects, smaller budgets, but yeah. So we went from WordPress to Drupal to Shopify. Now we're right back at after four years of bad websites, we know exactly what we need and we're rebuilding it again on WordPress completely custom. So I think you just gotta, you know, make a decision, just make sure you're not making a catastrophic decision, you know, um, and not be afraid just to make and keep moving forward. You just have to take a step forward every day, regardless if it's gonna push you back one or two steps once in a while, you still gotta try to make a step forward every single day. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I say that to people all the time who ask me, you know, how do you get started? And it's like, you just take that first step. I mean, yeah, I think I that's to. a lot of people don't, you know, they're not, they, they don't know where to start. So they don't start anywhere versus well, it's, just it's start fear somewhere. Based. Yeah, it's fear based and it's analysis paralysis there. I mean, my wife was the, the ultimate push. I was like, we have a good life. Like we have good money. We no debt. Like, why are we doing this? And she just saw like how excited I was about it and how passionate I was about it. And she's like, do it. Like she's a lot more of a risk taker than I am. So, but uh, yeah, I think it's fear-based and it's just people overthink it. Like there's businesses like that are 50 years old making the wrong decisions still after 50 years, but they just right. learn, learn, know how to recover and keep moving forward. Right. Um, just got to have the, make the best decision you can with the information that you have at the time. That's right. So how long from idea concept to actually, you know, accepting orders and delivering on, on, on the service? Um, so I, I talked to like, you know, friends when I was thinking about this, we, you know, in the early times you talk to friends and family, right? Hey, what do you think about this? Right. Yeah. Um, I had a, uh, I have a friend that's in banking that we asked, we asked him if he'd wanted to send like some cards to his clients and that and we had orders within a month of talking about this and finding a technology that can write it. It was just the, the product wasn't good in the beginning. Um, it just, we needed to develop it a lot before we actually like took it to market. So I would say from day one, we had orders. We just didn't, we weren't really a, a viable option for probably at least a year because yeah. we just, had to see or to build a website. We had to see what technologies would work, we had to test different pens, different types of paper, understand postage, right? Find a print vendor. Um, I had to find a business partner. I went to California and um, there's a buddy I've grown up with. I basically I talked him into coming to Arizona and yeah. starting the company. So um, I was basically doing this all in my house for the first year. And uh, I would say, yeah, it's a good 12 months before we had a good product that I felt comfortable selling. But I love it. Uh, we're still trying, are working with us for that time. So we, we were talking offline and, 
people who are listening won't see this. I have a, a, a whole stack of these, um, you know, from the desk of Greg Spillane cards. And I, I had them printed with the idea that I was going to do these like handwritten thank you notes to people, which I think I, I said I wrote like two of them because I just got lazy and stopped doing it. So I I already know like the value that uh, just giving or receiving kind of a handwritten note or card uh, after a meeting and just, you know, people keep them. Right. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think I read somewhere statistically, like people don't throw away handwritten stuff. They'll just, they'll store them. They'll just leave them on their desk, which is a great reminder of who you are. Yeah. Um, I would also assume there's a use case around sort of outreach or prospecting. Uh, maybe just talk a little bit about how, how people use these and how people use these successfully. Yeah. So um, we always recommend, well, first the average person receives seven uh, handwritten letters a year. Um, I, I think it's less than that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a mailbox. I see what comes in my mailbox every day. But um, people use this from everything from just saying thank you, birthday cards, anniversary cards. Um, they do bulk mail prospecting campaigns. But I really think how somebody should use our platform is just use us to build better relationships with their clients. Um, we all know it takes more money to bring on a new client, acquire new, new clients. Um, versus just keeping your current clients happy. But, you know, just sending a thank you card, um, I think no matter what, if you're not looking for that ROI, because a lot of people want to know what ROI and we can submit studies and showcase studies. But people, in my opinion, should be more focused on just, you know, saying thank you. Hey, we appreciate you. Um, staying top of mind. Um, and the ROI will come because they'll become a, a better client. They'll spend more money. They'll refer their friends. You know, for example, yeah, here's a great, you know, um, here's a great uh, example. We have a, a luxury hat brand that automates sending thank you cards to clients who spend more than $100 with them on their first purchase. Mm. And what happens is, I mean, it's the same message. All they do is they insert, you know, dynamically a first name. But what happens is they send a card from the CEO. And these people, like, literally when they get it, like, they take a picture and they share it on, you know, Twitter or social, like on a, on like a story and it's creating like a viral aspect. Like think about what, what that's doing for your brand. You know, how is that building, you know, your image out there in, in the world? Like, Oh, this brand cares. This guy cares. They took the time and sense to think, you know, that's really cool. And that, and that sticks in people's brains, you know, versus like, Hey, like cold message. I want to sell you something. Right. But there's a time and place for everything. But I think that just to say, thank you, it's what's most important. Um, in today's digital age. Yeah, no, that makes all the sense in the world. I have a little uh, direct consumer business. It's, it's a, kind of a passion project. I started with a, a couple of buddies uh, as a co-founder and we do fitness equipment. Uh, primarily, um, one of our big products is uh, our, these kind of like high performance barbells for functional fitness athletes, CrossFit athletes. But I'm just thinking to myself, like how yeah, I might, I might do it when we get off the call, uh, how I could incorporate this in our business where you just do that. You just automate it on the sale of a product yeah. and send people, send somebody a handwritten card. It just seems like such a great way to build community around your brand. Yeah. And a lot of marketers and online e-commerce brands are just, they know what Zapier is. If you know how to use Zapier, you can automate sending cards, you know, all year for multiple different, uh, you know, reasons. Mm -hmm. And everything is dynamic as long as the information's in your Shopify account or your Word, WordPress web, website or Wufu, you know, form, whatever you're using. As long as the data is there, you can plug it into a message and make it super personalized as much as you want. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, that's just automating. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of cool ways that, that companies leverage us and you know, integrating and automating is a good way to do it. So. We were talking uh, offline a little bit about uh, life. You're an entrepreneur. You have a, a, a three-year-old company that you're you're growing and you're scaling and, and things are going great. I'm, I'm sure that's keeping you super busy. You got two young kids, four-year-old and a two-year-old. Uh, you're, you're, you're still very athletic. We talked about just the, the training aspect you've, you know, you run Ironmans and, and those types of things and are, mm -hmm. you know, very active outdoors. What, what, what's a typical day, day look like, look like for you, man? How, how much yeah. sleep do you get? Yeah. So I actually just got a whoop. I don't know if you know. Whoop oh is. yeah. Dude, I, I, but, I'll tell you my story on the whoop afterwards. Yeah. Huh? I was just like, I was so run down, um, in October of last year. I was like, why am I, like, I have no energy ever. Like I'm 33. I'm like, why am I so tired all the time? I knew it was you know, kids in the startup, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm nonstop 
Um, I mean, I've always been this way, you know, even when I was playing sports, like my life was all about what I was doing. And it's the same thing here. I wake up, you know, I'm checking SEO stuff. I'm working with my blog writer. I'm fixing, you know, broken links on my website. I'm sending emails, you know, for the first one to two hours, you know, five to 7 a.m. Then our kids wake up and um, our kids wake up and, you know, I'm right to dad time for an hour and a half. And then I'm working from nine to five, nine to six, go home, do bath time, you know, spend some time with my wife and then I'm right back in the office. Like um, I started doing some workouts at lunchtime. You know, I've been doing that for a while now. So I'm trying to get like, you know, back into the, the physical shape I was in, but I'm just nonstop. And that's what we're talking about. It's really hard to shut off. And um, um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, the whoop thing is interesting. I, I, I got one uh, probably over a year, a year and a half ago, right when they first started to take off. And, and I think it's a really cool product. So this isn't a, a knock on Whoop at all. But, you know, I got it. And I was tracking my sleep. And, you know, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, it'll it'll give you things like uh, I think there's like a recovery score. Recovery score. Yep. Yeah. And my recovery squad wake up and <laughs> some days. uh so I got COVID. I got COVID early on. And my recovery was the slowest my recovery score ever got. I think I had one morning, I woke up in 1% recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so my body, the, the whoop could try, tell I was sick. But uh, I, I would feel like pretty good. And then it would be like, your recovery score is 27%. And I'd be like, oh, I guess I don't feel the very psychology good. psychology messes you up. It was like, up. yeah, yeah it, it was messing me up. It was yeah. like, I don't need this thing to tell me how I feel. Like, the only I just reason need to that is... And believe me, I, I felt the same way. I stopped I stopped wearing it for like a month because like I'm tired of it just telling me I'm not sleeping, right? But it's yeah. all about your HRV. So Yeah, it, that's right. It, yeah, it's what it is. Yeah. It's about that's your right. heart rate variability. So that's what I've been working on. You know, and you do some meditation. I do a lot of cold tub stuff. Um, you know, you know, get good sleep, get you know, hydrate, try to manage your stress. And you might I've I've literally tripled my my HRVs since wearing the whoop, just being a lot more uh, conscious about it. Really interesting. Yeah, yeah that yeah. was something I, I I had not figured out how to impact my HRV. It just seemed to be kind of random at times. Yeah, it's 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 exercise, cold tub, hydrate, meditate, um, or breathing exercises. Sure. Uh, you know, people think it's weird, but uh, uh, there's a great book called Heart Breath Mind, and it talks about you know getting into your resonance breathing, um, and it's real. Like I don't know if people, I'm sure athletes are really a you know, open to this type of stuff, but mm -hmm. your HRV is really important. It, it, it tells you how your body's going to adapt to stress, how it's going to adapt to being sick. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of research and studies into it. And it's, that's what I, I mean. I do a lot of HRV training. Yeah. No, it makes sense. So how much, you know, it's one of the things I'm trying to figure out right now is, is similar to you. It's like, how do I get more time in my life? Right. I'm, I'm, because I think maybe, ex-athletes or whatever it is, or all gluttons for punishment. Maybe it's just an entrepreneurial thing. I'm actually starting another company right now. I'm in the middle of a startup, bootstrapping it to this point, um, long hours, mentally draining. I have you know other ventures that I, I kind of manage and run on, on the side, but I have two kids. I coach. I want to work out. I want to stay active. I want to be somewhat of a present husband at times. So the answer just seems to be like, well, wake up earlier <laughs> and do more. Uh, and I'm trying to like wrestle this, like, I don't want to get to the point where I'm like sleeping for like four and a half, five hours. Like if that, yeah. that doesn't feel healthy, but you know, how do you get up at four thirty-five in the morning and kind of get your day started? And yeah. So I mean, it's, it's a challenge that we all have for me, you know, the answer for me, um, one is technology. You have to leverage technology. Um, Zapier is a lifesaver for me. Everything that mm -hmm. we do here at Simply Noted is really, you know, built in or in around Zapier. Everything's automated to when somebody signs up to our website, to when they request information, to booking an appointment, it's all automated through workflows. And then another thing, you know, I listened to a built built to sell podcast and um, they really, every episode, I, it seems like they talk about standard operating procedures. Mm -hmm. Every entrepreneur, the hardest thing is that we are super control freaks. Um, we just want to do it and we want to have our hands in it. And um, we have too much information in here. Right. And the only way to scale and not feel, you know, like you have this, 
you know, 10,000 pound boulder on your back is to be able to offload that work and be able to write it down so other people can do it. Um, and I'm, I have a challenge and I mean, I'm hiring sales reps, like how do I train them effectively? What information do they know? What's the best way to do it? It just takes work, right? But yeah, I would say automate this and use as much technology as possible, right? And uh, have standard operating procedures because that's gonna free up, even if it's an hour a day, I mean, seven hours a week, right? Um, that could be all your gym time, that can be your family time. Um, you have to create those hours, you know, with technology and writing stuff down. Yeah, look at you, man. And you're, and you're a defensive guy too. You know, it's usually, it's usually the offensive guys that think like that. You know, you're, you're, you're... <laughs> so I actually played quarterback. Um, oh, did you? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I played you were... quarterback in high school. Okay. But, I mean, I was much more defensively mine. I had, had an inner rage that yeah. if I got sacked. If I got sacked, I wanted to like go at the guy in the next play. I was like, let that guy through. Like, I want to, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, I want to punish him for sacking me. <laughs> Well, when you were describing your, your sort of your tenacity, it, it, uh, it immediately brings to mind those, you know, like those just defensive ends, like the Joey Bosa type of guys that just yeah. high motor, like, I'm just, I'm not stopping. Like you're, yeah. you're not getting me to quit on this play. And, yeah. uh, you know, so it translates really well. No, yeah, I, I, go ahead. No, I was, that, that's I, when I went to the NFL combine, that was like the first sentence and like my athlete profile was high motor and high motor like, guy. High yeah. motor, Yeah, seriously. And, uh, like some people saw it as a knock and I was extremely proud of that because I'd rather be known as somebody who is relentless and will stop at nothing versus somebody who's just, Oh, this is a super freakishly athletic guy. You know, you can, we had a saying in our, our locker room in college is hard, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And like that That's resonated right. with me. I was going to outwork. I was never the best. I was still not the best, right. But I'm going to be better than myself every single day. And I'm going to outwork the people around me. And even if some people work just as hard and are more gifted, I'm still going to push and that's going to push that person and make them better. Right. And I always play team sports. Right. So, I mean, basketball, volleyball, football, just having that extremely competitive, you know, with yourself type of personality, as long as you don't make it, you know, about yourself, but you're just having that internal, that, you know, internal com competition, you're going to make everybody else around you better as well. And that's what I, that's one of the big things I miss about being, you know, an athlete at a high level is you're just around all these types of guys that are the same and it makes you better, right? Because they're super competitive as well. Yeah, that's, that's a really, really interesting point. I, I was interviewing a, uh, a, a really, really great dude named Jelani Jenkins a couple of weeks ago, and he, uh, just started a company called, um, it's, it's, a uh, it's an app and it's geared towards ex athletes. And he talks about, he played five years in the NFL and he talks about when he got out, he went through this like almost depression because, you know, you leave this situation where sports college level pro level, it's so structured and, and there's a regimen around it and you, you have people around you and they're telling you what to do and how to do it. And then there's this like concept of like the brotherhood that comes along with it, right? The locker room, you're, you're around your, your, your people that you work with. And then all of a sudden it's like, you're out of it. And it's like, how do you replicate that into your, your outside life? So I have a really good answer for this. Um, mm -hmm. This is actually like, if I'm lucky enough to, you know, someday exit from Simply Noted and, you know, be able to control my time, I want to start, if it's a business or a podcast, you know, about what's next for athletes, because mm -hmm. I can completely resonate, you know, with what you were just talking about. You almost have like a loss of identity, but um, athletes don't realize like how well they are equipped to be successful in life after sports um, with all these skills that they've developed, you know, over the last decade or 15 years of being a competitive, super, uh, you know, good athlete. And, um, you know, just work at the commitment, grit, right? Um, perseverance, um, competitive spirit, um, locker room mentality, right? Like just brotherhood, right? Like every company is out there just foaming at the mouth looking for someone like that to add to their team but it's really just getting their mind to think about like you know even though i'm not playing in front of seventy thousand people anymore like i can go and have a huge impact you know at a company you know on on a similar magnitude right you can still have that competitive drive you can still have that recognition you can still have that self-worth it just has to be taken from here and learn how to transition it to there 
Preach, brother. Yeah, man. Uh, you, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think you pretty much summed up exactly why I had the idea to start this podcast in the in the very beginning. And you know, I think you uh, clearly encompass all of those qualities. I mean, just you know, from your athletic background, but how you've applied it to your professional life and what you're doing at your your company uh, right now. Um, it's really good talking to you, brother. Wish you all the, all the success in the world. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it, man.